grace and peace be multiplied to you, <clears throat> excuse me, through the knowledge of God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome today. We are looking at the topic the incomparable king, the incomparable king, the king that has no rival, the king that cannot be matched, our Lord and our Savior, our Redeemer. But we we run short of words to be able to express our gratitude to him and the the the, the indescribable like call it titles that he carries far beyond what the human language can express so we're looking at the lord jesus christ as an incomparable king there is no king like him the king that combines sovereignty and salvation together sovereign and savior meeting in one thing that is unmatchable and every time we have to go back and acknowledge him as our king as our king we're saying that look we have an authority over our life we have one who is seated in the throne of majesty who is fending for our affairs whose passion is to express himself through our life everything wonderful meets in this king so we're not just talking about kings generally have a uh, a territorial boundary that is they have a jurisdiction through which they exercise dominion he alone is a king that does not have boundaries to the uh, extent of his kingship or of his kingdom of his empire the whole universe is his empire so he's an incomparable king because everything wonderful it's, it's actually his name is wonderful his name is counselor his name is the mighty god his name is the prince of peace the everlasting father so everything wonderful whether it is a wonderful life a wonderful uh, career wisdom power righteousness whatever can add value to humanity meets in this thing. That's why the scripture tells us that in him grows the fullness of the God there bodily. There is nothing good that any human being will desire in life that the reality is not in this King of Kings and this Lord of Lords. And part of this is just to acknowledge his Lordship and his Kingship over our life. God loves to speak of no other but him. All through the scripture, there's one thing across that God is pointing man to. God is always pointing us more and more to Christ. If God is going to change my level, or not if, when, anytime God wants to change my level or any one of us to change the level of a city, a person, a family, all it does is to show us more of this thing. Is to point to it, say, no one can come to me except the Father has draws them. And whether it is in the world, is the team or the sub, is the crux of the word of God. Um, whether it is from the tree of life, <laughs> when God told Adam to eat of uh, the tree of life, God is always pointing us to him, to behold him, to look unto him as the author and the finisher of our faith. And as we behold him as in the glass, we are transformed from glory to glory. He's the center of every plan of God, every purpose of God, every the means through which God will carry out anything is also pointing back to him. Angels love to praise him. Maybe from here I could just read a few scriptures from Revelation 4. Angels love to praise him. They all bow down and bow before his throne of majesty. And if angels do that, we better obviously be glad to be privileged to also be able to bow down before him to say, Lord, there is no king like you. And let me just go to one of my. Sometimes when you have a lot of Bible. Uh, translations some of them come with adverts and okay Reve i'm right there revelations chapter 5 let me read okay chapter 5 chapter 5 is good chapter 4 as well verse 9 and when he had taken the book the four beasts and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb having every one of them halves golden bells full of orders which are the prayers of the saint and they sang a new song saying thou art worthy o lord to Thou art worthy to take the book to open the seals thereof, and that you are slain, you are re you have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand. It's just innumerable. So all who are taught by the Holy Spirit love to exalt him. Actually, he said it in John 15, 16 as well, that the Holy Spirit 
he bear witness of him, will show us things concerning himself. So the more someone is exalting the Lord Jesus Christ, we can tell that this is the Holy Spirit as well, because it is the Holy Spirit that exalts him to say, no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Spirit of God. It is actually is the Spirit in our opinion. From Second Corinthians 3, 17, and now the Lord is the Spirit. So the more the Spirit is working in our life, the more we'll be acknowledging and exalting and praising the Lord. What a joy. Inspired writers and not dead writers, preachers, whether in the uh, gospel artists, uh, ministers, apostles, everyone that is inspired and anointed by God, they are always showing us newer dimension of the freshness of His excellency. There's no extent because the knowledge of Him is far beyond what any human can be able to comprehend. Every scripture, there is a, it's a bottomless depth that it has. And because it is the word of God, so there's always fresh, fresh, fresh dimension of this person. And that's actually the real organic food for our soul. Our soul prays for no better food than the knowledge of Christ. It's the true food that ministers life to our spirit. What a joy to the greatness. He's the great king who sits and rules upon his throne. David sang a lot about him king of Zion. You talk about the king of his people. And a king generally is, um, apart from having a civic um, rulership or governorship over the people, a king also sees to the welfare of the people. And the kings also, in, the, in, in times of battles, generally the kings are the ones that we could almost say the frontier of the battle. It is from the out. So if you look at Christ as a king, for example, that there's hardly any battle or any confrontation, anything will come across that he's not aware of. Nothing catches him by surprise. And this is not just a king that is domiciled in the palace, but this is a king that is present everywhere. As on his head are many crowns, so he is so he is enthroned on many thrones. It's not just his, his crowns are, are more than one, they are more than two. I think Revelation 19, 13 talks about the many crowns that is upon he said, and it's thrown too. It's not just one or two. Revelations, I think, uh, 19, 13, let me see, 19, 13. Revelations 19, 13 says that, uh, and it's quoted with vessel deep in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And uh, of course, uh, and he had a vesture high. On the star, which is written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and also I think in Revelation 22 is also this present to you that upon his head are many crowns. So it's not just one crown, and is a king that is also enthroned on many thrones. Hebrews 4 talks about the throne of grace. Um, Matthew 25, I think, talks about that he uh, upon the, the the throne of glory, and it's not just one. There's also the white, the great white throne of judgment, which is for the ungodly. And but the joy of it is that this is a throne that is invisibly everywhere. So there is no other king that has his throne domiciled everywhere. <laughs> Christ is the only king that his throne is invisibly, uh, that is, he has authority and reign in every sphere, whether underneath the earth, whether in the waters, whether in the air, in the heavens. His throne, that is almost, he, he needs no scepter to rule. His presence is a scepter already. Yes, I know the scepter of righteousness, but he doesn't need a staff of authority to be able to carry out his desire. His presence himself in me. So his throne is invisibly everywhere. And, and part of this is that when the more we know of Christ, the more we study him, the more we can trust in him, the more our soul will find super rest in the midst of a lot of noise. And because he's the only one that can that peace to any heart and so to be aware that his throne is not just limited to heaven even where you're walking in the neighborhood where you are and this is what gives us confidence in the place of intercession because we know there is no authority that is above him we know there is no place whereby he can exercise his influence because he's the ruler of the kings of the earth he sits high he sits on high on he sits high on the throne of all power and supremacy. All power and authority have been given to him. There is no such thing like um, a power that can be matched with him. He created all things in the first place, so I mean, <laughs> there is no how a creature will be greater than its creator. 
So everyone bow to him. Let me read more from that revelations. Maybe we just read some few eulogies of our king, so to say, in curriculum we say some of it. Uh, verse, uh, let me read verse 10. It says, Revelations 4, verse 10. The four and twenty elders fell before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crown before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you have created all things for thy pleasure, the word created. So from his royal seat, all events are ordered. And we could call this the sovereignty of our God or the providence of our God or the, 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 the attribute that makes him to do what he, what he desires, what he pleases to do, however he pleases to do it with whoever it is and whenever he desires to do it. And so nothing just happens by accident on the earth. I'm not saying that um, everything that happens is sponsored from him. In many cases, even if it looks unpalatable, or maybe farming in the land, for example, he has often allowed certain things because he has seen the end, that the end will probably bring glory to him. Maybe a lot of people now will see their need for a savior through those maybe uncomfortable situations. But there's hardly anything that happens on the surface of this earth here that he, um, he, 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 it catches him by surprise because no more to God that all his works will be you know, He speaks and the whole universe submits because his words never return to him. But actually, everything was created by his word. Everything in heaven and earth, it is as he spoke. They came into the and they hear the they know the voice of their master. So let me go to Revelation 5 as well. Uh, Revelation 5, I mean, I, uh, I read a few of them earlier on. Verse 17 say, saying with a loud noise, What is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing? He governs what he created and lawfully so. So he has a right to govern what he created. So it's not like is usurping his influence over things that are beyond his jurisdiction. No, he governs what he created and legally and lawfully so, and nobody can say to him, What do is thou? And God uh, is such, uh, he, 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 he is a very good God. They say, Hold this and say that the Lord is good. And I'm saying that in the sense that. He's always looking out for the best and the highest good of his creatures and what he's doing. Hardly does he doesn't have malice in him. He, God doesn't have any bitterness, so to say. So, in that sense, anything that he's doing is motivated by his love, his compassion, which will always be for the good of uh, the people. The perpetuity of his love is as his protecting power. So there is no end to that love. It's an, that's why the scriptures call it an everlasting love. A love without end and a love that also had no beginning. This was a love that existed before we were even created. That's why it's called everlasting. So it's not because we were created that he loved us. It's not because we sinned and we turned back in that he loved us. No, this love existed before we were even created. Actually, that, that, the this love is actually what we could call the sponsor or the root or the foundation of why we were even created in the first place. So, his protecting power is also, also ever there, shielding us, guiding us. And so, his love makes his power to work in our favor. That's what makes him to work in us, to will and to do for his good pleasure. Without his love, his power will probably destroy us. <laughs> and what a joy that that love is always ever constant. He rules over his church by his word and his spirit. The church which he purchased by his own blood and through the word, through himself as the word and the spirit as well, he exercises his influence in the church. So it is by the word of God we are transformed in the church. You know, Israel is a type of the church and we see uh, the church is um, a, the reality of the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. So. We came out of Egypt, the kingdom of darkness, and yet we needed to be transformed. So it is through him as the word of God that we are transformed. And also through his spirit, we are being conformed to his glorious image. So he did not just redeem us to on the fully of our own, to do what we want to do. No, we were redeemed to be his expression on the earth, to be his living epistles among men, to be his light shining forth his brightness everywhere. 
is more than King David for victories over foes. And so that's why we said it's, a, it's an incomparable king. Because if you look at other kings in the Bible, there is no king that is comparable to him. Actually, those kings were emblems of him, the offices they occupy. So if we talk about the greatest king in the Bible, we talk about David without, uh, um, without any arguments on that. And David exercised that. And that's why he is actually the root and the, uh, and the offspring of David, as God is the root of David, because David the greater David. And as the uh, as a man is the offspring of David because he's from the lineage of David, and so we see that David David is known as a symbol of worship and warfare. The worship, the Psalms, and the warfare, the wars he went through. But we have a king that is greater than David for victories over foes. Yes, Goliath is a type of the kingdom of darkness, but God, the Son, derooped the enemy. Made a public spectacle of them. So when we are talking about victories over the enemy, there is no king like him. David was able to conquer a lot of external enemies, but uh, it was a situation which we all know. In the case of Bathsheba, there was an enemy of uh, 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 that the flesh had the better of him at one period, but not our king because he's, uh, he's he said the king of the prince of this world came to him and he did not find anything. So it's also more of a king than Ezekiah for restoration and uh, reformations for he makes all things new. Ezekiah did a lot of things. He stopped when he came to power because he stopped Israel from worshipping of, of all that dead gods because they are backslidden and, and they're doing despicable things before God. They brought reformations to lead the temple and set things in order. But this king is greater because he makes all things new. We have a new covenant, we have an access, all the, despite everything Ezekiah did, the people could still get into the oldest of all because the price had not been paid. But Christ now makes all things new, a new covenant, a new way and living way into God, a new wine <laughs> in the spirit, a new, a regenerated spirit. He's also infinitely more than King Joshua for law. Also, Joshua did great things as well. He, it's almost like he, re, he brought the heart of the people back to God and true the demolition of the uh, false um, idolatry that was worship that was all over Israel at that time when it came into power. Um, but we have a king that has more love than Joshua. And he's not just telling us to, he's not just showing us love, but he's actually, he's shed his love upon our hearts. And now, we are now the expression of that love. He's now the one loving the unlovable through our lives. What a joy to this king infinitely more than King Josiah. Also, when it comes to terms of wisdom, he said the greater than the greater than Solomon is here. It's infinitely more than King Solomon when it comes to wisdom. His wisdom is unmatched. He is wisdom himself. He not only gives wisdom, he not only created the heavens and the earth with wisdom, but he is his own wisdom. Normally, the wisdom that any creature has is a, is a derived wisdom. Either wisdom from God or wisdom from studying or wisdom from impartation or whatever, it, but it's not it's not originating from anyone. But we have a God and a king whose wisdom, he himself is his own wisdom. His wisdom is not from learning, from borrowing, or was it given to him? He is the power and the wisdom of God. What an incomparable king we are. That means for any situation we are going through in life, that's why he said that. Um, I think in James he said that uh, uh, that if any man lack wisdom, let him call upon God. So no matter what we're going through in life, and we'll come across situations whereby uh, our human intellect, our wisdom, so to say, cannot handle it. So we run to Him every now and then for the wisdom for the season. The wisdom, like year 2024, for example, there's a wisdom to get up to a greater height and uh, walk with Him, or even have more influence on this earth to shine as light. The wisdom for our workplace, our career, the wisdom to run the family, the wisdom to run the ministry. Oh my God, what a joy. So his empire is universal. His subjects are innumerable. His empire is across the nations of the earth, across all strata of existence. And his subjects are innumerable. In the angels are even innumerable, let alone... <laughs> the creatures that he created as well. So there is nothing that is uh, immune to his sovereignty, immune to his, I would like to call, um, I don't know the word influence, there is nothing that is immune 
to be under his control. All things are subject to him. Actually, we all obtain our life from him. His majesty needs new decoration. <laughs> no such thing that let's make this thing more beautiful. Let's put this teach that here. Yeah, let's oh, will it look nicer this way. No. We are talking about beauty that is too magnificent to behold. That the majesty of our Lord needs no decoration. He's God and God all by himself. Whether it is his name, whether it is his wisdom, whether it is his power, whether it is his works, whether it is whatever the Lord is, the Lord he has made all things beautiful. So his majesty needs no decoration. I mean the words can't even express it, and that maybe part of the reasons why the angels are continuously bowing, thou art toward the O Lord, thou art toward the O Lord, because they are seeing newer dimension of his majesty. His power is unrestrainable as his throne exceeds all authority. All authority means that authority over sickness, authority over the powers of darkness, authority over even constituted authorities. Every one of them, as Romans 13 tells us, it is as he will that he puts those in positions of power. And not for us to be boasting against them at all, but it's for us to be aware that, look, we are not, we should not, um, uh, we be afraid, so to say, of human authority, or whether it's even a cruel one, because we know there is a greater authority above those in power. Yes, they are, the breath they are breathing is coming from him. So his power is unrestrainable. His power cannot be hindered. His power is boundless. It is inexhaustible. It knows no limits. It has no beginning. It has no end. <laughs> he rules in the midst of his will with his power because his throne exceeds all authority. And that's why when we are interceding, when we are praying for a change in our nation, a change over our land, we know that it's going to be happen because there is no power that is above his power. What a joy. His throne is not constructed of gold, but of glory. Everything, I mean, is is an all-purpose gold savior. The, the gold in the temple, the gold signify royalty, and the gold in the temple, in the tabernacle, then you know, we have the golden uh, incense altar, we have the golden lampstand, we have the Ark of the Covenant, which was with wood and overlaid with gold. Those, and of course, in Revelation chapter 1, the robe was wearing. I mean, you can see gold all over. That is to, it's, it's called the symbol of royalty. And gold is his creature. It's, it's part of the things he created. But it's, it's, it's an honor that his throne is not constructed of gold, but of glory. That is a glory that is infinitely beyond any <laughs> natural gold. Um, yes, heaven is paved with gold, no doubt about that. But we are talking about the glory of God that has that that exceeds any kind of definition anyone can place on it. He ransomed his people from the battlefield of hell. Yes. It's uh, a king can be in the palace and not know what the plight of the people in the city, the plight of the peasants. That is not the type of kingship our Lord Jesus Christ is. is a king that came into the territory, the region of death, which we, his people, were stopping. I mean, our rebellious state in Adam. But he came to rescue us from the hand of him who was stronger than us. So he rescued us from the battlefield of hell in those three days that he died, that uh, he laid down his life, essentially he passed through death. And so he won them in garments deep so it wasn't a cheap, it wasn't, it was an agony. He went through crucifixion, one of the most disgraceful and most painful way to die. So it wasn't a cheap, our redemption was not cheap. Now that's why First Peter Paul said that we are redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we see even though he has much to do with that. But because our sin was infinite in the eyes of God, so we needed one that was infinite as well, but embodied in a finite body to be able to pay for our redemption. So he redeemed us, his people, from the battlefield of hell, from the kingdom of darkness, and he was not without him shedding his blood. And that's why we are ever grateful to him today. So the life we are living today, we owe to 
this victory he has procured for us in the New Testament. His throne is encircled with rainbow, the emblem of peace, and we can see that in Revelation chapter 4, where around the throne, Revelation chapter 4, let me read from verse 2. And immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, the throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that was, and he that sat, was to look up like a jasper and a sandrine, and there was a rainbow round the throne inside, like unto an emerald. We learned actually, of course, it's a reminder that what he said that he wasn't going to destroy the world with flood again. So that is ever before him, which is a symbol of peace. And of course, we said he sits on many thrones, and the throne of grace, which is where he desires to be that we should come and meet with him because that's where he dispenses his favor and his mercy. He overrules all things for his own glory. This is one of the things that should bring comfort to us that um, he alone has the final say over any issue. And that's where we now build our faith that look, no one has the final say over affairs of our life except him because he's the author and the finisher of our faith. And that's why we spend more time with him. That's why our hearts should be upon him, not on the noise that is around or the happenings. Yes, we are still in this world. We are not ignoring those happenings, but we don't allow the, um, the, the steering of those water to dampen our faith, just like in the case of Peter, whereby the boisterous wind was making all the noise and what have you. But as long as he kept his eyes on the Lord, those external things could do nothing. So he overrules all things for his own glory. And this is why, even for us as well, nothing just happens to us. Nothing comes our way. But we are grateful to God. And that's why in all things we give thanks to him. Because in the midst of the praise and worship to him, we find out that those things will work together for our good. It takes grace from God. I'm not saying it is easy, that especially in the midst of a contrary situation, but the grace of God is what will make us even to worship Him, to praise Him in the midst of situations that we can't even explain. Because worship in the midst of a dark situation is Solomon will always be born. And so it is not always... As, yes, worship is sweet when everything is going fine, but when the winds of life come in, when the floods do come in, it takes an empowerment by the Spirit of God to still worship Him because He's able to overturn all those things for our good. His actions are always for the preacher's eyes. And this is part of the reason why we are worshiping. So we are not just saying worship, worship, or praising in the midst of a contrary situation. It's because those things we actually need to, you could imagine the Lord being crucified and um, he's being told to worship God in the midst of that. Because that is the way <laughs> resurrection will come. And so in the midst of those praise, even if it was sponsored by the enemy, even if those circumstances were in Jeddah by the kingdom of darkness. But we were, if in the midst of it, if we praise God for a day, God will make it work together for our good. And the enemy will say that, wow, had we knew we would not have touched this child of glory. Because God controls the heavens and the earth. And so it, it, it just takes grace in the midst of those trials, in the midst of those situations, for our hearts to be in a posture of appreciation and thanksgiving to God. It might not make sense, but we are grateful that you remain on the throne. <laughs> that nobody can take you out of that throne. And that throne, all things are subject to that throne. His perfect ease, with perfect ease, he rules over even the most irrational of creatures. We can go through Job 37, 38, 39, God asking the question, you know, who is it that can tame this Levitarian, this great beast and what have you? So even the most irrational of creatures, or whether animals or humans, they are not above his control. He can say the direct the flow of a river, uh, it directs the heart of things as easy as the flow of a river. So many things, many times when God is revealing himself to us in a higher dimension is so to bring peace into our hearts because we need to be reminded over and over and over about the greatness of the God that dwells in us. He needs no army to defend his throne. He is his own security. Hallelujah. Our king is his own security. Other kings have no choice but to have, actually defense is many times the number one in every budget of any 
nation on what it's done because they want to defend their territory from enemies. But this our king, he needs no army. Though because every he has a who is it called the Lord of hosts. The animals, the creatures, they are all members of his host. The stars can fight for him. So he needs no army to defend his throne. He is his own security. And that's why we are enjoyed to take security or take our shelter or safety. That's why the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are safe. So he needs no army to defend the throne. What a joy to the greatness of this great incomparable king. He rules with calm, dignity and majesty. Hmm. The, the, uh, there are kings, there are kings. I mean, so many bad kings and leaders, I'm sure the world has experienced and But when you're talking about, and many times when people have such a great power, there's this very, um, uh, what I call it, proud and very flagrant abuse of power because maybe, for example, uh, they can do and they cannot do that territory where they are or they've been able to conquer some nations or countries or what have you and you start seeing the flesh you start most but not so with our king with calm dignity and majesty he rules over the heavens and the earth and many a times because let me take a case like Nineveh many times that what we deserve is judgment or whether we are a nation and yet he will send his prophet so that we can reconcile our way we can repent so that he will not destroy because he said fury is not with him he doesn't delight in destroying he delights in building up his grace beautifies us so the grace of god over our life is actually the grace of our king and as um that witness day of blessed memory said that grace is god and his son being everything to us in the new testament everything being our shepherd being our food being our life it is actually god and his son and so grace is what beautifies our life Grace, that is, God himself is what beautifies our marriages, our careers, whatever we are doing. We are, that's why the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. That is what makes us different from the past. That is what makes everything we are doing clothed with divinity. Because of the grace of our King. Because grace is from him. And his throne is also, one of his throne is also called the throne of grace. And he invites us to come there boldly. What a joy. He said, grace and peace be multiplied to you. He also said that, um, that I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. The grace is the covenant of grace. His righteousness also clothes his people. We need a garment because our garment is torn. It's not only torn, it's filthy. We can appear before God with that torn garment. So we need his garment of righteousness to come before him. Almost similar to uh, the wedding the parable of the wedding where the wedding garment so the children this garment of righteousness is what clothes us uh, we can say we lost the glory of god in the garden of eden when the man sinned and we were naked we were not just naked we were trying to cover up our nakedness and um, god had to come to rescue us and through our the seed of the woman who is now our righteousness before god now he also empowers us by his spirit to walk in holiness and in righteousness so his righteousness clothes us as people that's the that's that's the boldness that we have to come before a holy god his kingship is without beginning and without an end his kingship like his greatness his priesthood neither one of them had a beginning because they are as everlasting as it is there will be no end to his reign so there is not a four-year period that is coming that another four years will he has ruled from everlasting, from an eternal past to eternal future. He will remain on the throne. No one can challenge his authority. So his kingship is without beginning and without an ending. And that's the that's joy to us because we know that even when our assignment is done on this heart here, we know fully whether we are not, it's not that like we are we are going to meet with a surprise that another person may be a pharaoh that did not just say we arise. There's no such things here. So his people are the jewels. We are the jewels of his crown. The beautiful jewels of his crown. The signet ring, so to say, that is upon his right hand. And it takes so much joy. And that's why he died for us. I mean, what how else will he prove his love for us? Is a greater love 
can any man show that for a man to lay down his, his life for his friend and his covenant partners, that's what that friends mean. So we see that we are the crown. It's like, and that's why in Revelations 1 as well, John said his, his hand that he saw that was still pierced, he still living it like that. That so that we are so that we are sure that he's still ever conscious of that sacrifice that he did on our behalf. So we are the jewels of his crown. We could say there the signet ring upon his right hand. We mean so much to him. He loves us dear. He loves us dear. For him to do that, and that's why we 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 we, we don't take for granted that one another in the body of Christ, because he that the Lord loves, we dare not start looking down on them. No matter, even if they're not showing all signs of spirituality and maturity, he still loves every one of us that he died for. Because his death is the source of our life. The life we're living now is the life of the resurrected Christ. As Galatians 2.20 said, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. So the life that is in us, the life that is powering our life, is a life that has gone through death. It is the risen life of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the source of our life. The human life can't do us any good because that human life was polluted in Adam when he sinned. So the joy of what we have today is that the source of our living today is actually from his death. Because it is that death that now produces the grain of wheat that can that has now reproduced. We are now the many grains that, that single grain of wheat has reproduced. And that's the source of our life. He's always pleased to be approached by his people. Very, very pleased. With open hands, he said that we by no means cast away any that come to him. One of the beggars or, or the, I was asking that if you will, that will you heal me? He said, yes, I will with compassion. He never created any one of us. The toil we went through was because our first parent <laughs> so I mean sold humanity to the kingdom of darkness. So it's not his will that to, there will be a distance between us and him. And that's why he went to pay that gruesome price so that there will be no gulf between us and him. But as often as we want to commune with him, right there in our heart, we are able to have conversation, to thank him, to appreciate him, to just be grateful for all. He has been to us. He is the eternal home of his people. He said, Abide in me and I in you. So we have no better home than him. So it's not just our Savior, it's not just our Lord, it's also our place of our home. That is a, is a realm in itself, it's a realm where we are living in. So an invisible realm, a mobile realm, that wherever we go to, this realm follows us. So it's our eternal home. What a joy. John 15 said, Abide in me and I in you. And so we are guaranteed that we carry his presence wherever we go to. And so his name is a strong tower we run into. We dwell in the secret place of the Most High because he is the temple of God, he is the dwelling place of God. And so he's our eternal home, he's our eternal joy, he's our eternal salvation, the author of our redemption. What a joy. So he's the eternal home of his people. There is no better home than Christ. Is our permanent address, so to say, or some forms or some things we do feel we ask us. Is our permanent residence, is our permanent address. What a job. So the rich man's wall is not a home is rich. Neither is the poor man's heart below his rich. If nobody's is so tall that he can't reach them or so low that he can't speak to them. That's the kind of king we have. We have many kinds of things that look Maybe they could have people richer than them in that location, or people that they can't stoop themselves. But we're talking about a king that is the epitome of infinite condescension. I mean, he left all his glory and incarnated to be a man, born in a manger, not even in the palace. He came as taking the outcast position because we were the outcast, we were chased out of the Garden of Eden. He now came as an outcast to be able to bring us to the Father. Oh wow, he was born like an outcast. There was no place found for him in the end. No one was born in the manger. And that was not even the end. Even when he was going to die, he was crucified outside the gate. 
and these were just pictures of this is what the shame we were supposed to go through but they took it on our behalf so we need him all through this life for much more in death so there is no sort there are certain things that are relevant in certain periods of in this time so many things around us are relevant in this side of eternity and so many things are actually useless the moment a person passes on the kind of car that they have, the type of house that they have, their education process, it means absolutely nothing. They cross to another realm entirely. But when we are talking about this great asset and treasure that we have, an incomparable king that is not just in the palace in heaven, but is making his home in our heart, we are saying that much more that after our assignment is done here, we have a reward that is even waiting. So head or tail we still win every time. So we need him all through this life but much more in death because to be absent from the body is to be present with the lord and so we are ever grateful for he has prepared a home for us he said in my father's house are many goods he is in his world to open our minds and we actually need this because that's how we get transformed that's how we walk in the counsel of his will that's how we don't fall we don't fall to the bait of the enemy. So he is in his word, and I pray that we continue to get more grace to be able to meditate on the word, to be able to fellowship with him in his word. Because he said we shall allow his word to dwell in our hearts richly. Everything he's going to do in our life is going to be to the instrumentality of his word. The more of his word we are hiding in our heart, the, because the word is himself, the more the word can reap in from our life. The world is a seed. We plant more of it in our life. It can open our minds. It can enlighten us. Earlier on today, I was giving you the heaven of India. But when it talks about if your eye is single, your whole body will be full of light. And that eye is like mental vision. And Hebrews 4, I think, says that we should fix our thoughts on Him. Because as we fix our thoughts on Him, we are being transformed from glory to glory. He's the only one that can change, truthfully change our position, change our level of authority in the realm of the spirit and in the physical so he is in, he's in his war to open our mind he's in his camp to empower the soldiers he's not a general or the top military uh, maybe the the captain is the captain of our salvation he takes the forefront he says that uh, in john chapter 10 that he's the good shepherd is the good shepherd that goes ahead. Others are hirings. When they see the wolf coming, they run, they take off. But no, he goes ahead of us. What a joy. <laughs> what a joy. So he's in his camp to empower his soldiers to train our weapons for war. And that's why we are called the soldiers of Christ. And these battles are not really physical per se, but they're spiritual because what we are not fighting against flesh and blood against principality and he's the head of all principalities and power. He's also in his field to reward his laborers. In his field, I mean the field, the world is his field. And so as we and he gives to everyone according to the field. And so that's why we labor in his world. That is why we labor in doing good and working in law and a lot of things we can't do it in ourselves. That's the fruit we now bear as his, as members of his body. Because he does give reward for our diligent labor. So he's in his field. So he's not just uh, a king that he needs somebody to be reporting to him, those who are doing excellently, those who are not. No, no, no. That's why I said you're either hot or cold. Or he knows the condition and the state of everybody, the level of everyone's level of diligence or carelessness. He feels the infirmities of his people. Our names are inscribed upon his heart, or their names are inscribed upon his heart. He has inscribed our name upon his heart. He said that, um, can a woman forget, example, can a woman forget her child? Yes, yeah, so our names are forever before him. And in the Old Testament, you know, I think the priests will wear uh, the breastplate and the twelve part of his web were written on it, and which essentially is what we believe. And Revelation chapter 1, our names are written upon his hand. I don't mean like or what I mean, but it's ever before him. So he feels our infirmities. Many times we really don't even, not that we don't need to tell him what we are going through because people will pick on that and go to town. But truthfully, there's hardly any infirmity we are going through that he's not aware of. And now it's a totally different ball game if 
our attitude is such that to thank him that even before this game, we even first to repent because some things it's uh, our own undoing that causes those things. So I would to repent before him, to ask for grace, and now for our eyes to be open in terms of how to come out of that situation to his glory. He's always accessible. He's never over patient. He neither slumbers nor sleep. And always with a ready smile to meet anyone that comes. Always with a ready smile. As our Lord and Savior. <laughs> because it's his delight. We are the sheep of his pasture. We are the fruit of his death. <laughs> the price he paid. He, he did it for us. And essentially so. It, re- it delights in us. It delights in us because I delight in members of my body <laughs> because I need them to do what I'm supposed to do here on earth. And the same with our Lord as well. He's always accessible with a ready smile. That's why He calls us to come boldly to His throne of grace. Other lights are but darkness beside this King's light. Every other light is darkness. He is a light. Here is light above all light. The brightness of his light is such that no other person can approach. He dwells in a light that is unapproachable. Other knowledge or other strengths are but weaknesses beside his might. His might, his omnipotence is infinitely beyond anything that can ever be described. So other strengths are but weaknesses besides this king's might. We're talking about a power that has no origin. A power that has no beginning, a power that has no, no, no boundary, a power that is unlimited, a power that can do and not do. Every other creature's power is as indicated to them. And that's why Philippians 4.13 says that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He said in our weakness, his strength is made perfect. So in the place of prayer and waiting on him, we exchange our weakness for his strength. Because anything he has called us to do, it takes his power, it takes his mind, it takes his spirit to accomplish it through our life. As all light is in the sun, so is all blessedness in this great monarch. Every blessedness is doing inside in him. And that's why I say we look unto him, they were look unto him and they will light him. So all blessedness that we can imagine is in this great monarch. Is it the blessed divine life, the wisdom of God, the power of God? the presence of God, the glory of God, the goodness, the mercy of God, every blessedness we can think of. Let me read Romans 9, 3. Romans 9, 5 says that, Romans chapter 9, verse 5, talks about the very God unto whom. Romans 9, Romans 9, 5. Who is the Father and for whom concerning the flesh Christ came? Who is over all? God blessed forever. Amen. So all blessedness is domiciled in Him. And so that's why um, we, 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 He tells us that look, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and everything will be added. This incomparable King is a mile of old wells. <laughs> I was watching something last week, a documentary on how gold is gotten from the earth. Assuming. Like three kilometers down the earth. There was a place in Quebec in Canada. There's a document also showed Ghana, South Africa, also some part of the US, how they would dig, 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 dig. And here we are, we are talking about the one that actually put those treasures in there. So this incorporated thing is a map of untold wealth. Untold wealth means that it is immeasurable. It is infinite. You can't quantify it. It's on such a basification street, put it. And so his life cannot be quantified. So if we will start with the life he has given to us. We will start with the wisdom that he has. So he is the sun, the rock, and the life of everything desirable unto eternity. The sun, the brightness of the sun is just an emblem of the shining. We are talking about the rock. The stability that is and from that rock we take refuge the life that is like the software that is powering our life of everything that is desirable on to eternity for this God is our God 
So it's a song the rock and the life of everything desirable unto eternity. For the joy to the greatness of our infant presence is true what is inexpressible by any mortal tongue. It is beyond, there are no vocabularies, and that's why we thank God He had to give us the language of tongues, the language of praying in the spirit. So, because it is through that medium, we can actually, uh, our spirit. And find liberty to express words that there are no languages that can contain the heaviness of that word. So it's true word, because it's true word is not something our final brain can be able to comprehend. Because what he has revealed to us in his word is infinitely more than what he has revealed. His word is just what he considers sufficient for our salvation and our work with him. He doesn't mean that that's everything about him, there are infinitely more about him. And also on the last page, Talking about the might of his omnipotence, about that his almightiness is the property of his everlasting arm. So there is nothing difficult with him. All power and authority belong unto him. For, and that's why he has given to all. Almightiness is the property of his everlasting arm. So today we've been able to look at the topic of the incomparable king, Christ, the incomparable king. There is no king like him. We could never have a better king like him. There will never be a better king like him. His kingship is everlasting, it has no beginning, it has no end. God talks of no other than him. God loves to talk more about him than any other person. The angels love to praise him. They bend and to bow before him. Anyone that is thought of the Holy Spirit always love to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ. He ransomed us by his blood, he redeemed us from the battlefield of hell. It's not just a king that is stuck in the palace, but a king that actually lives inside of us. He domicides, he's domiciled inside of us, he's walking in us, go to will and to do for his good pleasure, his beauty is over his people, his righteousness is the clothes that we wear. It is because of what he has done that we can come boldly before the Father. And also we is our eternal home. So and that's why we say that this true word is inexpressible by any mortal tongue. So every day, let our rejoicing, let our thanksgiving be actually God has said that thanksgiving to Him should always go through Him because of what He has done for us, what He's doing for us, and what He continues to do. Upon His head are many crowns, He sits on upon multiple thrones, and He has given us His spirit. He rules His church by His word and His spirit. What a joy to the goodness of our risen Lord and Savior. Hallelujah to God the Father. Hallelujah to God the Son. Hallelujah to God the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah.